Well, it's certainly not mistakes, and I think the whole session is a good indicator that cooperation is key in, in cancer patients. I actually thought I should have called this lung complications of radiation therapy because that's actually the organ which is affected with significant disease, as we've seen with Professor Rübe. Um, I've got a few disclosures, which is mainly honoraria for lectures and advisory boards from different companies. I'd like to start with a case, and it's actually quite an old case. It's a lady with breast cancer who underwent right mastectomy and uh, uh, radiation therapy to the chest wall, similar to what Professor Rübe just showed. And she developed dyspnea, cough, and fever. And we obviously were able to see on a plain chest film that there was an area of consolidation, but we couldn't quite understand what was going on. And as we've heard before, the differential diagnosis often is, is it's recurrent tumor, is it a complication such as infection, or is it a complication of the therapy? And what we usually do as radiologists, if we can't solve the uh, case with a plain film, is cross-sectional imaging. So we went on to a CT scan. And this is really a very, very typical finding uh, of CT abnormalities in this patient, because what we see is a consolidation that exceeds anatomical borders. It simply crosses the, uh, the lobar fissure here, uh, but it's got relatively sharp margins. And that those two are key features for radiation pneumonitis. So if we deal with the differential diagnosis, this is certainly a feature which will make it very clear that the patient does not have pneumonia, and it's very, very unlikely to represent local recurrence. Anyway, not in a patient with breast cancer, in the mediastinum, but uh, if it was a lung cancer patient. Uh, on the other hand, you've seen uh, the radiation portals Professor Rüber showed, and we asked ourselves the question, why did a lady with a radiation of the chest wall in breast cancer develop pneumonitis like that? This doesn't fit because the radiation port doesn't fit. So we went back and got some information, and actually the radiation had been done for a metastasis in the, in the bronchial system and not the radiation of the chest wall, and then it fits because this is, as I said, a rather old case. She was treated with APPA fields, as you had seen before, and this border here really reflects the border of the radiation part in this patient. So that's the key feature, uh, consolidation exceeding anatomical borders, but with sharp margins reflecting the radiation part. This is a similar case if you look at the CT scan post-therapy in a patient with lung cancer, very sharp borders, uh, crossing the anatomical borders here, and that is the pre-radiation scan in this patient with a central lung cancer, again treated with an APPA field. Uh, the figures which I am going to present now about what happens in the lung at what doses are different from what Professor Rübiger just said, and that's probably due to the fact how we measure this. As radiologists, we obviously are very sensitive in detecting abnormalities we may, which may not be symptomatic in the patient. Um, and also, as we have heard, the dose which actually causes an effect in the lung is modulated by pre-existing lung disease, by concomitant chemotherapy, by other drugs. So the figures are not uh, identical, but figures which work quite well for us as ra radiologists, as diagnostic radiologists, I think is that it's rarely to see uh, radiation effects on the lung on imaging at doses below 30 gray, although, as you've heard, the larger the proportion of lung involved, the more likely the patient is to develop symptoms and uh, also develop imaging findings. Between 30 and 40 gray, uh, the appearances are variable, but above 40 gray of lung dose, we almost always see uh, changes in the lung. And if the patient has got uh, concomitant <coughs> lung disease or chemotherapy or other drugs, these doses may change. The other thing which is quite helpful is a rather typical time course because radiation pneumonitis usually starts with ground glass opacity and at that very early phase, this may not completely reflect the radiation part. So in this, these are three different patients. In this patient, in the very early phase, not the whole radiation part actually is mirrored by the radiology findings, but it starts at some uh, areas and then later it will coalesce. About three months uh, after radiation, and to be precise, after reaching the threshold of 30 to 40 gray, we will see consolidation like in this patient, so dense infiltration, obscuring pulmonary vessels or bronchial walls, and then almost um, constantly there is a change towards fibrosis, and after six months we usually see things like this, so traction bronchiectasis, uh, 
some stranding, but the consolidation usually does not completely resolve, but rather resolves with some sequelae. Uh, and we can usually tell that it's fibrosis because of the traction effects on bronchi or on interloba fissures. Uh, this time, course is obviously not identical in any, every patient because the radiation oncologist may need several weeks to deliver the dose, which then is the threshold dose, or they may deliver it in one day. So what you really don't want to know is when does the radiation therapy start or when does it end, but when was the threshold dose uh, reached in, at radiation therapy. Usually, immediately after therapy, we don't see anything. This is a patient who underwent rather complex radiation for the mediastinum and a single lung metastasis. And two weeks after radiation, we see no abnormality. And this is normal. It's too early to see the effects. Seven weeks after radiation therapy, the image has completely changed. We see, again, a consolidation with a sharp border here, crossing the anatomical border of the lower fissure. And around the metastasis, we see some more diffuse consolidation, but this is typical. No findings early on, and after two to three months after reaching the threshold, consolidation. This is a rather long time course on conventional imaging in a, another patient with mastectomy, and she developed uh, radiation pneumonitis uh, due to the chest wall irradiation. So this is an anteriorly located area of the chest wall. She had a mastectomy, as you can see, on the soft tissues on the left. And pre-radiation, there's just the um, asymmetry of the uh, chest wall. Then after three months, which is probably six to eight weeks after reaching the threshold dose, a ground glass uh, infiltration starts. A, a month later, it uh, has coalesced to dense consolidation. Another two months later, the consolidation has started to shrink. And after 14 months, this is what uh, stayed with the patient for the rest of her life, a smaller area of probably just fibrosis, much smaller than the initial field, but it does not resolve completely. So this is a typical time course of radiation pneumonitis, which may be modified by therapy if the patient is symptomatic, but in an asymptomatic patient, this would be the typical time course. The time course may differ, however, in patients who don't just get radiation therapy. And there's a term called rebound radiation pneumonitis, which means the patient has had irradiation involving part of the lung with or without clinical or radiological radiation pneumonitis. And then that usually, if it was present, it heals. If the patient is, and the patient would be asymptomatic then and would have no uh, sequelae of the radiation therapy, which is visible on imaging. If the patient then undergoes an additional therapy, which provides additional lung toxicity, and it's usually chemotherapy during the course of the disease, that may lead to the fact that the radiation pneumonitis reappears after uh, the normal intervals. So if a patient has findings suspicious of radiation pneumonitis, but the interval is too long, since the original radiation therapy. It's a good idea to question whether the patient has ha received any therapy which caused uh, additional lung toxicity. It's usually chemo, but it may be other drugs. Uh, and then the typical time course is not typical anymore. As we've heard, these simple fields, which I've just used uh, to demonstrate the typical findings, are not that common anymore. Radiation therapy has introduced a lot of modern techniques which all to the benefit of the patient, result in higher dose in the target volume and lower dose in the normal tissue. For us, as diagnostic radiologists, it makes life more complex because the radiation ports look, as you have seen in Professor Rebus' presentation, quite complex. And what I think we really need as diagnostic radiologists in questionable cases is the radiation planning. And one of the projects in our hospital is to actually re-import these radiation plans into the PEC system of the diagnostic radiology department because we need to understand which dose has gone to which part of the patient, and ideally in uh, three-dimensional views. Here, for example, a patient with consolidation after radiation therapy to a left um, central lung cancer, it's very easy to decide that this, obviously, this sharp border is due to that border and the radiation planning. So if you know what the total dose was, you can actually look on these maps which percentage of the total dose was delivered to which part of the lung, and then you can compare whether that fits with the susceptibility of the lung to radiation. So it's much easier once you know the radiation planning to assess these findings.
This is the same patient in the frontal view, and it's quite easy to be sure that this is very unlikely to represent local recurrence because it exactly reflects the radiation <coughs> part in the radiation planning. But without that plan, it would be very difficult to decide. Here's another patient with a central metastasis in the left hilum, and you can easily see how this curve in the radiation planning is actually reflected by the consolidation later on. The whole lung has shifted a little, the mediastinum has shifted a little, and you have to take that into account, but usually it really reflects very precisely. And this is my most favorite case because the patient had this little tongue of increased radiation in the planning here, which later then was reflected by the tongue of consolidation here. And it's impossible to make that diagnosis without the radiation plan. This you've seen in a very similar way, chest wall irradiation in a patient with bilateral breast cancer in this case, and the small area of radiation pneumonitis here. This is a single shot radiation therapy called cyber knife or radio surgery. So the patient receives a single, usually very high dose of radiation uh, in a very small volume. This was a solitary lung metastasis in a patient who had undergone resection of other lung metastasis in the left lung, so she was not fit to undergo an additional surgical procedure. And again, after two weeks, you don't see anything because the lung hasn't had time to react. After three months, you can see two things. The metastasis gets smaller, and there is some um, consolidation in the area. Here, the metastasis almost disappeared, and also the side effects, the consolidation, uh, go back. So. In order to understand these imaging findings, it's very useful to know what therapy the patient received. And you can also see that the time course is quite typical of what I described before. Now I've got another case for you, similar to the one uh, I started with. Another female with uh, a dry cough and low fever uh, following breast conserving surgery and adjuvant radiotherapy of the chest wall for breast cancer three months ago. And these are the CT findings in this patient. So we have different areas of consolidation. And in that patient, obviously, they could not follow a radiation part because that would cover the lung here. So we decided this was very unlikely to represent radiation pneumonitis. It didn't look like metastasis. So we just followed the lady. And you can see that there is some loss of volume in this lesion. This has gone back to a streak rather than a roundish lesion. And the, the bigger lesion in the back also decreased in the time course of eight months. And this is a rather common finding in patients undergoing radiation therapy. This is crypto, it's organizing pneumonia. It's usually called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. But in this case, we think it's not cryptogenic because it's probably related to the radiation therapy. Organizing pneumonia it can be idiopathic. That's when it's called cryptogenic or it can be secondary to a variety of causes. Collagen vascular disease is one. Several drugs can induce uh, organizing pneumonia. It can develop a post-infection patient who has had a simple cold and develops uh, organizing pneumonia later. And it's been described uh, to be quite common in radiation therapy patients, more common than you would expect them to develop it if it was not related. And this is different in many aspects from radiation pneumonitis. The time cost is very variable. So even after almost a year following radiation therapy, it may appear and that this would be much too late for the radiation pneumonitis. The consolidation usually does not correspond to the radiation part. So it can well, and it usually does, occur outside the radiation port. And there's also no minimum dose known. There is no threshold which predicts whether the patient will develop uh, OP post-radiotherapy. It's just important to think about it. It's usually self-limiting. Uh, patients usually are not symptomatic. But as a differential, it's important to know. So what you should you take home from my talk? Radiation pneumonitis has a threshold. It's rather rare, below 30 gray, and common, above 40 gray. Uh, lung dose, but that is modulated by pre-existing lung disease and concomitant other lung toxicity. There's a very typical time cost, so once you know when the threshold dose was reached, it's relatively easy to be sure whether the time cost fits with the diagnosis of radiation pneumonitis. As I said, uh, the, the findings may be modulated by other lung injuries, and it's quite important that the infiltration ground glass first, consolidation later, mirrors the radiation part and crosses anatomical borders. Thank you very much for your attention.